Well, thank you, Florence, and good afternoon. My guest is one of the most sought after actors working on stage, screen, and television. He began his career at an early age in the Mighty Ducks trilogy, followed by his breakout role of Pacey Witter on the pop culture television phenomenon, Dawson's Creek. Go ahead. <laughs> Opposite, Katie Holmes, James Vanderbeek, and Michelle Williams. On film, he has gone on to star opposite Dennis Hopper in Americano, Donald Sutherland in Aurora Borealis. Reese Witherspoon, Sarah Michelle Gellar, and Ryan Philippe in Cruel Intentions, Ian McKellen in Apt Pupil, and Glenn Close in The Shape of Objects. Other films include The Laramie Project, Ocean's Eleven, Scream 2, and Urban Legend. He received the Best Actor Genie Award for his role in one week. He made his stage debut in the West End opposite Patrick Stewart in David Mamet's Two-Hander, A Life in the Theater. Other stage work includes Smart People for director Kenny Leon. Television fans around the world know him as Peter Bishop on the science fiction series Fringe created by J.J. Abrams. Yes. And currently for his role of Cole on Showtime's hit series The Affair, starring alongside Ruth Wilson and Dominic West. And the affair will kick off its eagerly awaited fourth season on June 17th, right? Yes. And now he is making his Broadway debut as James Leeds in Mark Medoff's beloved play, Children of a Lesser God. Please welcome Joshua Jackson. Thank you. Yeah. Greetings. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for having me. Welcome. We were saying it's finally spring outside, right? Yes. <laughs> you know, I remember speaking with you on opening night and you were on cloud nine. I certainly was, yeah. Children of a Lesser God is your Broadway debut. So welcome to Broadway. How does it feel? <laughs> I mean, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> Every night is, it's such a joy. It would be such a joy in any circumstance to get to be on Broadway, but to do something this complicated <laughs> that is this demanding, it's such a joy to be able to put that out there every night. And we have such a wonderful company of actors that make the thing happen. And I have this very particular, unique, I mean, unique in my entire career relationship with Lauren, my leading lady, um, that just ch has transformed this into a very different kind of experience. So every single night is a, is a joy for me. Because you were sensational in this play. I know we have a lot of people going to see the show tonight, right? Yeah. And a lot of people went across the street to buy tickets Thank while you. they were waiting yeah, in line. Very conveniently. Yeah, totally, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's Couldn't literally... have planned that any better. <laughs> yeah, totally. Like I said, you were sensational in this play. Tell our audience about the role of James Leeds and the journey you take us on and what you love the most about playing him. Um, okay, so piece by piece. So the, yeah. the character... Of, well, the, first we have to set the framework of the play. So the framework of the play is a memory play from... Um, indeterminate time after the story but that's being told, but we meet James in the very beginning of the play and he is, he's relating this time in his life, which means that I never ever leave the stage because I'm telling you the story of my own life. So for two hours and 15-ish minutes, I'm just up there giving everything that I possibly can. And because um, the story is the, a love story between a hearing man and a deaf woman, I have to sign. It is the, the requirement of Mark, uh, of, of Mark Madoff, who wrote the script, that all of the deaf and hard of hearing people who are represented in the script actually be deaf and hard of hearing. So in order for me to be able to perform this, just from the onstage perspective, I had to learn sign language to do this. Wow. And, right? yeah, yeah it's, been, it's been a heavy year. <laughs> <laughs> and also, because Lauren is pure deaf, if I didn't, you know, learn sign language, I couldn't actually communicate with her. And so, you know, for any actor to want to be in that, in that relationship with someone else, you have to have the conversation, right? You have to be able to be in that place where not just what we're doing on stage, but I need to know you and I need to know how you tick and we need to understand each other. So I had to, you know, it's been, that's been actually part, Probably the harder part is expanding my vocabulary set so I can get an insight into this woman that I'm on stage with every night. How did you learn to sign? Was it a challenge? Did it come easy? Uh, no. <laughs> no, it has not been easy. So in initially I was taking lessons in L.A. and I would do, well, me and my teacher would basically just do 
a segment of the, usually like scene by scene. So we would do scene by scene and we would record a little video so I could go and practice on my own time and then I would come back and, and work with him. But really we did an out of town run of the show in the Berkshires last summer and it was actually getting into the rehearsal process last summer. We would finish our day, Lauren Alexandria Wales, who was our ASL uh, director, and myself would go usually to Lauren's house, but someplace, and then we would spend four hours after rehearsal just doing the, the scenes every day just to get me proficient enough to be able to perform. And in that process, I learned how to communicate with, I mean, slowly, 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 but surely, but with Lauren. You make it seem, for those of you who've seen the show and those of you going, mm -hmm. you make it seem effortless. Yeah. yeah. The, yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. <laughs> like just sitting here doing it, it seems like a, a new natural it's thing you become, do. It's become, yeah, it's like, it's yeah. annoying to some of my friends actually now because I speak <laughs> even more with my hands than I ever did. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's something that I have to use all the time just to keep it flowing. Sure. You go on such an emotional journey of telling this story. It's nonstop for you, like you were saying. What are the biggest challenges been for you with finding your rhythm because you're never off stage? Um, so the, that's actually, so partially I've achieved this and partially I haven't. Okay. In retrospect now, I wish that I was, uh, I didn't actually see it because I was on stage, but I, as social media was talking about Beyonce's thing in Coachella last week and everybody's like, my God, I can't believe that she can sing and dance at the same time for, at that level of intensity. For an hour, I was like, I need her <laughs> breath trainer. Like, because it, it, the, in a way that I didn't really understand when we got into this, the amount of uh, breath control that I have to have, m much more so than any other play that I've ever done, because I am constantly in motion and constantly speaking. So, and there are these, there's certain sections of the play where I drop into the Sarah character's first person voice. And so to be able to recite my lines and then immediately recite her lines is a trick, <laughs> right? To be able to like squeeze all the air out and get just enough air in to like be able to make sure that I can make it through her dialogue is difficult. So if I had, if I had, if I knew now, if I knew then what I know now, I would have gone to somebody to teach me how to better control my breath. What was the first part of the question? No, that's great. No, 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 no. That is really, that, that's, that's the question I wanted to know the answer from. Because, but that also a lot has to do with your director. He's working with one of the finest directors with Kenny Leon. That is true. Um, what makes him such a sought after director? Well, he's great. Right? I mean, in, yeah, the, in yeah, the simplest yeah. terms, he's just a fantastic <laughs> director. So personally, the reason why I would choose to run through a wall for that man is, yeah. is I, he is the best set of eyes I've ever worked for. And I have such a complete trust in his, um, in his being an audience. He has all of the technique, he has all of the craft, he has all of the insight. He, I mean, I have worked very hard on this show and, and the only person that I know has worked harder is Kenny. I mean, it wakes him up at night, literally. He will, he will send a text at three in the morning because in the mi middle of a dream, a piece will come to him and he'll know that that's like something that has to get put in the show. So it, it almost to an unhealthy place, like he, it, it breaks him to do these things. Yeah. But he also is just a phenomenal audience member. He, with no BS, will tell you in real time, like, you know what? I didn't feel that, or, or what are you trying to do right here? Because you just, I mean, I see the effort, but it's not getting there, so we gotta figure out a different way. And he's very direct, which I appreciate, and he just is brilliant. He's just brilliant. Yeah. Does the rhythm change every night depending on the audience that's watching the show? So, in a way that I will probably never experience again, the rhythm changes for the most amazing reason. So, I'm working with a woman who cannot take anything from the audience, right? She just, she doesn't hear them. She f sees the first couple of rows, but in a, in a very unique way. I mean, I can feel all of you guys, and yeah. if everybody's hearing in the audience, you can all feel me here. But for her, after the second row, the audience disappears. So she takes the audience through me. So if there's applause and my timing changes, that's how she knows. And so our rhythm changes based upon that, that our tempo changes based upon she can see me breathing through something, pausing through a moment, taking a beat, whatever it is, and she knows something is happening. It's a, it's a 
totally unique relationship that I have with Lauren. That is, I didn't realize it. That's yeah. amazing. Because I was going to ask you, my next question was, what is it like sharing the stage with Lauren Ridlaw? The, so for that, for so many reasons, this has been definitely the single most challenging thing that I've ever done, but, yeah. but so far the most rewarding thing that I've ever done. To have, so in the most basic sense, when you're on stage with somebody, you know, the, the dynamics of blocking is how you dictate power to the audience, right? But you can't leave a deaf person's peripheral vision. If I leave her vision, I cease to exist. If I turn my back on her, I cease to exist. If she turns her back on me, in her conception, she ceases to exist for me. So it completely changes how you relate to a person on stage when the, the dynamic of trust is, if I walk over here, you can't hear me. You, I am not a person anymore until you see me again. You have to be able to trust that I'm going to be there when you need me to be there. If we're going to get to a place where we're in the middle of a scene and it necessitates that I go off to this side of the stage while you're in the midst of this conversation, you absolutely have to know that I'm going to be there when you need me, that I won't hang you out to dry. So that bond and the building of that bond is unlike anything that I've ever had yeah. before in my life. And so that is the base level. And then to, to, <laughs> to work with somebody who is that good, just innately that good, but has never had the opportunity to have this form of expression is such a joy. I mean, I'm an actor for life, right? I'm in the tribe. Like, this is what I do with my life. But to see somebody come from like the green shoot to the mighty oak over the course of this process, it, I mean, it makes me emotional just talking about it. The, to, to see her get to just unleash the force that she has inside of her is a miracle every night. This must have made you a better actor. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah yes. I mean, she a better person, but yeah. <laughs> For those of you who haven't seen, you've got to watch them work together on stage. It's, it's just the connection, the emotional connection you have. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm literally yeah. getting choked yeah, up know, talking yeah. about it, which is yeah. a little actory of me, but, no. but, <laughs> but it is such a yeah. thing to be a part of yeah. every single night. I'd like to go back to the beginning. Growing up, where did your love for performing begin? And what were your earliest creative outlets at a young age? Uh, I, the, as the legend goes, I don't actually remember this, but my mom <laughs> tells me I used to, um, we didn't have a TV in my house for most of my childhood. So when we did, uh, I was most fascinated with the ads. And my mother explained to me that the kids got paid for playing with the toys. And I was like, <laughs> That seems like a fantastic job. So <coughs> I would recreate the ads in my living room for my mother, I think, is how it all started. But in the, you know, in, I, my mother worked in the industry, so I had, it didn't, it wasn't, hmm, how to describe this? So it was in my life as a thing that could be done, but I did not grow up in a, in a world in which it was something that was supposed to be possible for me. So it took actually quite a long time, even after I was a working actor, for me to give myself permission to, to do this job. It took a long time for that to happen. Was there a defining moment when you said, I want to do this, I want to be an actor, and try to make a living at this? <laughs> yeah, which is exactly the moment that it went away. So, <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. When, I was, when I was like 16 or 17 years old, I, I had the, the phase of my, like the, the kid phase of my career. And then I grew and my voice kind of dropped and I got all pimply and I was just like awkward teenager and everything went away, right? I, I was, yeah, I was 17 years old. So I had 17 years old and I went through this like really dry stretch. I couldn't get any work. I was auditioning all the time and it, I was like, well, I guess this is it. Like I had my run and, and now I'm done. And it was uh, apt pupil that brought me to LA that allowed me to be in L.A. in the time when Dawson's Creek was doing its audition process. And if those two things hadn't have happened, I would be telling you, well, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. <laughs> wow. So I was going to ask you, how did playing the role of Charlie in a musical version of Willy Wonka and the Chalka <laughs> Factory change everything for you? Um, so first, it was my, my first real experience on stage. Um, it was my first 
real experience doing something that was personally important to me, because at that point I just barely started my career, but I'm a huge Roald Dahl fan. And it was in that moment that I, that the woman who had cast me in my first movie came to see that because she had become an agent at William Morris. And she then brought me to William Morris, which is what started my career. I love that. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, so born under a lucky star. I love that. So did the film Crooked Hearts kick off your career? Yeah, so Crooked Hearts, so my mother was a casting director. Yeah. And uh, before I was a professional child, my mother was incredibly leery of, of allowing me to get into this business. She saw what that did to kids and had no desire to professionalize her children. But because she was also a single mom, I was in her office a lot uh, over the summer while she was casting that movie. And after auditioning and auditioning and auditioning other people, finally the director was like, why don't, because her assistant was also a single mom, so that we two boys would just hang out in the office and we were there all the time. And finally they're like, why don't you guys just come in and just read this? Just come on in. <laughs> and they ended up giving us the job. <laughs> That's a great story. Yeah, I love actually, that. and it go, it's, yeah. it's better than that. So apparently, I, I got it. <laughs> it was on my eleventh birthday. Yeah. yeah. So that's a good thing. I, apparently, I got the job because I because when they said you guys are playing brothers, I just threw my arm around them because we knew each other so well, and they didn't really pay attention to the words, which became a problem, <laughs> because then when we got to set, <laughs> we had to re my first day ever on camera, we had to reshoot the first day because apparently, and when I asked the director, at the tender age of 11, no less, I was like, well, why do we have to reshoot this? I thought we did it already. He's like, well, when you walked in the first day, you did this to the mark, <laughs> and then you stood there like someone had shoved a broomstick up your ass. So maybe we need to reshoot that. I love that. So not an auspicious beginning to my on-camera career. <laughs> so you learned about marks and you learned about all that stuff, right? And yeah. continuity and stuff, yes. right? Yes. I love that. You have this wonderful career, so let's chat about some of the highlights. Okay. And just tell me what comes to mind, a story or a great memory. Uh, Charlie in the Mighty Duck series. Fans? <laughs> <laughs> the whole sound booth up there, they're obsessed with those movies, the gentleman up there, playing young and aspiring hockey player Charlie. Why do you think these films became so beloved? Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, that like the, the most positive is because they're not cynical. Yeah. And they're in a way that, I mean, we still do this to kids, that we, we pander to them and we think that they're stupid, frankly. Yeah. And those movies were sweet and they were charming and with a couple of maybe little exceptions, they didn't treat the audience, which was young people, as idiots. Yeah. And I think the kids were relatable because we were all going through it and it wasn't like kind of the most typical Disney fair. So I think that is why they stuck with people. And then, frankly, Disney stopped making movies for kids, <laughs> right? So I think that we were the last era. So I think that the reason that they've had such longevity is because if you are a parent now and you want to go back to live action, like non-animated films for kids, like 97 is kind of the end of it. And, yeah. and they just don't do that anymore. It may, it's done on television, but it's not done on, in film. Because my new young nephews are obsessed with these films. Right. And yeah, because like generation after yeah, generation. Yeah, because you just don't see that, like, that representation stopped in the film world yeah. kind of in that era. They're great films. You were known to millions of fans for your breakout role, a Pacey Witter, <laughs> on the hit television series Dawson's Creek, right? Did you originally audition for both Pacey and Dawson? Oh, yeah, yeah, and, not, and multiple times, I, I think. Yeah. I can't remember exactly what the number is, but it's, I don't think I'm being over the top when I say, I think I auditioned for that show like 17 times. Are you serious? Yeah, it took, the process was so yeah. ridiculous. So I had never, I was in town for another job, and I'd never auditioned for, uh, I'd auditioned for TV, but never in pilot season. So the pilot season process is. Tell some people. Tell just absurd. <laughs> There are so many cooks in that kitchen. So first you audition for the people who are actually making the show, the writer and the director. So I did that audition. And then you audition for the people who are producing the show at the first level. So I did that audition. And then you audition for the network. Oh, no. First, first you audition for the, like, the money producers, which were for us was Sony. Yeah. So I did that audition, in which one of the producers actually fell asleep. And I'm not kidding about that. Um, <laughs> And then I did the audition for the network, 
which is like a multi-phase, you oh. go back and forth, do it with 17 different people. And the final audition for that was in a room so cramped, and I don't know why, but they had to have every executive in the entire company was there. So I so distinctly remember, I don't even remember if it was with Katie, but I remember reading the scene, and just the only thing I noticed was that this guy was literally behind a bookshelf, looking out from behind the bookshelf. <laughs> And that was the only space that he could get. And then in the old, the WB doesn't exist anymore, yeah. but in the old WB, so then they send you outside and you sit there and you wait and you wait and you wait. And, they, and it literally, like, they, they cast you off the island, right? Like some poor kid, you go to the bathroom, you come back like, hey, where'd Johnny go? Like, oh, Johnny's not here anymore. Like, <coughs> and then eventually, they literally bang a gong. I'm not kidding. Bang a gong and everybody who works for the WB that's in the office comes out into the room. And you think, like, am I about to be spit-roasted? Like, what happens here? <laughs> and they bang a gong, and then they all start clapping, and nobody tells you that you got the job. They just bang the gong, and you're supposed to know, like, oh, I guess I'm on TV now. <laughs> that is... I never heard that before. Yeah, it was absurd. What do you attribute the worldwide success of this show, looking back at it now? Of that show? Yeah, of Joss's Well, Street. same thing. It didn't pander to the audience. Like, yeah. the... I remember so distinctly the first round of interviews were about teenagers talking about sex, yeah. which, given that I was a teenager, I was like, we talk about this a lot. This is a major topic of conversation. And doing it in an intelligent way. It was so shocking or, or overwhelming to people that kids would be having intelligent, like, high-order conversations about their own lives in real time, which to me, as a teenager, was like, I don't really understand why that seems so surprising. So I think... You know, I, I think the, the thing, it was so specific in its, like, nice little white suburban self, but it was so universal in that everybody's going through that at that time in their yeah. life. And I, I think by not pandering to the audience, by not talking down to the audience, and actually in some ways even being occasionally aspirational, right? Like, the, I think the, the genius of Kevin Williamson for that show was to say... I'm going to make out loud the internal voices of all these teenagers. And I'm going to make them able to express the way in which we all want to be able to express but can't quite find the words in that moment in our life. And I think that's why it, it just touched a nerve. Yeah. But, you know, parents watched that show, too, because they were like, what are my kids going through? <laughs> but it's sort of nice for them to sort of understand through all of you. Yeah, I mean, in the, in the best versions of that yeah. show, I did hear that a lot where people would be like, you know, I can actually watch this with my kid, and it touches off a conversation. And yeah. in that conversation, I can now finally have some insight into, like, this kid who hasn't spoken to me in two months. <laughs> We'll now talk about what's going right, on. Right. That's great. That role catapulted you to instant stardom. How did you handle that so early on in your career? Well, you were all going through it mm -hmm. together, weren't you really? Like Katie I mean, and James? Katie was really the one who got the brunt of it. Okay. Um, I remember being, like, we shot the entire first season as one piece before the first episode aired. And I do remember being in L.A. right after it came out and not actually being very comfortable with this sudden, like, hey, man, how's it going? and just not being into that at all. So I went back to Vancouver, and I spent the off-season in Vancouver. But Katie went from being, like, we were all down there in, in North Carolina, and then I think within six months, she was on the cover of Rolling Stone. So she just, like, the avalanche came onto her very heavily. Yeah. I love it that you went home and, and like, went, went back to family. No, I love that. Yeah, it just wasn't, the, you know, the, I was too young to be able to process it healthily yeah. and not interested in the trappings of it at that, at that time. Boy, smart move on your part. What are your favorite memories of working on Dawson's Creek? Is it the company? It's actually the company behind the company. So that was, so my background, son of a, of a single mother. We went through some economic shifts over the course of our life. My father wasn't really in the picture. So... Dawson's was the first time I ever actually had money. And if I had had to do that, say, in L.A. or in New York or someplace where I could have gotten in trouble, I would have. And it was the first, like, the fame thing didn't really infect the experience down there because we were in, the, in North Carolina, so we were in this tiny little town. But, but having the family behind the camera, having that group of people who held you accountable and made you responsible, helped that transition for me immensely. So my fondest memories are actually that there was a group of grown people who were willing to respect me as a 
very headstrong young man and say like, look, there's a good way to do this. You can navigate this space and, and there's all sorts of guilt that comes around making that kind of money so early in your life and all of those things. So it was the environment around the show, not the actual on-camera portion, that was the best for me. Wonderful. During your hiatuses from Dawson's Creek during the seasons, you made such films as Cruel Intentions. Cruel Intentions <laughs> fans? I mean, Reese Witherspoon, Ryan Philippe, Sarah Michelle Gellar. Um, and some of the best dialogue I've ever had. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what you have, you have really crucial stuff in that. I mean, the whole blackmail yeah. thing and stuff. What was it like <coughs> working with that group? And was there any time during the making of that that you thought this could be something really big? Or did that all come afterwards? I, it's, I, I don't know that I've ever really, I mean, everybody, everything you're doing at the moment that you're doing it is going to be huge. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I've never really put myself into that mindset of like, Got oh, it. this thing's going to be a major success. And it really was, like, th that dialogue was just so fantastic and outrageous <laughs> that that was something that I, you know, I read it and I was like, yeah, I would love to do this. This is just amazing. And it was also, I think it was kind of before, Reese had already done her Disney thing, but I don't think she was a major movie star no. yet, right? Yeah. I think it was, yeah. it was at the beginning of all that, right? So, so it was before everybody kind of happened, yeah. do you know what I mean, myself included. Like the, there was this feeling of a bunch of kids getting together and, and doing something fun. Um, and then the world exploded for all of us. Great film, still holds up so beautifully today. I love that movie. <laughs> the Skulls, where you start opposite the late Paul Walker. Favorite memories of that film? Um, well, I mean, a lot of it has to do with Paulie. Yeah. And, you know, we were both, again, we was like such kids in that journey. And he, he was, he just was, is, was, shit. Such a, he was just a lovely, lovely man. And such an, like a truly, earnest in the best possible way, man. And um, yeah, I mean, being a kid on that set was lovely and, and it is truly a shame that he's gone. Yeah, I know. You must have learned a lot from each other working, coming up at the same time and working opposite each other. Yeah, and, and you know, our, and our career paths diverged um, after that, but also like we just at that moment that we met each other, we were again, sort of right at the very, not at the very beginning, we had both taken a couple steps, but ju just to like be around another, I, I mean, Polly was a couple years older than me, but basically the same age, somebody who was kind of going through the same yeah. thing. But more than anything, just the spirit of the man, he was just such a positive, happy, hardworking yeah. guy. Like he was there. I've had the benefit of not having too many true assholes that I've had to work with. Yeah, and you. you know, he was one of those, like just a truly earnest, hardworking man who was there for all the right reasons. Great movie, really great movie. Another important film was The Laramie Project for director yeah. Moises Kaufman, mm. The Laramie Project. <laughs> what made that so rewarding for you and why you want to be a part of it? Well, in the ways that um, occasionally you get to do something that is actually important in the broader sense, that story is important in the broader sense. And to be able to tell the story around Matthew Shepard's death and to be able to tell it in that very particular beautiful way that the Laramie Project chose to present it, and then to actually shoot it in Laramie, Wyoming, and to go back into, I mean, we had some very intense, yeah. very moving moments in that film. Like, what, at, the end of the, at the end of the film, when we go into the courtroom, um, and they're reading out the, the verdicts for the murderers, half of the audience were actually people who had been there because that was the most important moment that had happened to them in their life and they wanted to honor it by being back there and give their free labor as extras just just to represent so we had moments like that where you were just like wow i'm here doing a job and i will honor this job but there is something much much more important that is being told in this story so i mean that one that one was a again a very beautiful experience and a an incredibly touching experience. Yeah. It's a great film to look back at. Netflix has it, Amazon, it's, I watched it again this past week. Beautiful, beautiful job. The safety of objects opposite Glenn Close <laughs> who plays your mom. Yeah. Right? One of the hardest scenes I've ever actually done. Yeah. So the, I mean, 
kind of going to give away the story here, but uh, I spend... I, so the safety of objects is a story about how we are sort of controlled by the things that we think we're controlling. Um, and each one of the characters inside of that story has an object that is that they're tethered to. And I am Glenn Close's object. I, I've her, I'm her son and I've had a horrific accident and she's nurturing and care for me, but I'm not there anymore. And we had to do a scene where she kills me. And so in a non-responsive way, I had to lay there and watch and listen to a mother go through the process of choosing to do that with her son and not ever react. <laughs> it was one of the hardest things I have ever done. I mean, she, I could just hear her breaking, shattering into a thousand pieces, and every instinct in your body is like, it's going to be OK. <laughs> and, and I mean, she's a powerhouse, but. Yeah, that was, that was a tough day. Because where do you put yourself? Because as an actor, I'm sure it's all about reacting, but you're in a coma. Right, so, I mean, yeah. in that place, yeah. I mean, that's just a pure physical... We had a, a, a med tech on set who, like, gave the, the physicality of it. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, it's like you're just going through this mental checklist of, like, nope, no eyebrows, okay, the cheeks are okay, you're breathing normally, your eyes not flickering, hands not moving, not breathing too fast because you're not emotionally reacting, legs not twitching. Like, you literally go through this checklist of your body of, like, okay, yep, nope, you are not reacting. It's, a, it's, it's this weird sort of anti-acting exercise. Yeah. Great scene. I mean, the whole movie is but watching that scene yeah, play geez, out. It's pretty geez. amazing stuff. Well, shortly after Dawson's Creek ended, you played lead roles in films opposite some of the greatest and coolest film actors. <laughs> so first, what did you learn from sharing the screen with Dennis Hopper? Is it Americano? Yeah. yeah. So, so Hopper, I mean, it, I didn't, I, the sharing the screen was, was so secondary. Sharing a room. Okay. Like, just listening to oh. that guy, like, <laughs> to have yeah. gone through that era of Hollywood and to have been that guy in that era of Hollywood, like he was such a raconteur and had come to this new phase of his life at that point um, where he was, uh, you know, a daddy and he was married and he, and he had calmed down significantly. <laughs> but to just be in the presence of that and have him like, oh, that reminds me of this one time. I'm like, honestly, Dennis, you're the only person on earth who can say that. <laughs> <laughs> totally. He must have been the coolest man in the room. Oh, yeah, he was, yeah, yeah. yeah. Harvey Keitel in Shadows in the Sun. What was that experience like? That one was more difficult. Yeah. The, the, Harvey and I did not see eye to eye, honestly. And so that was a more difficult experience, truly. So how do you deal with that? Because this is a great acting thing for actors, too. How do you deal with something when you're not in sync with somebody or someone's not in sync with you? It, de it depends yeah. on the personality. So he's obviously a great actor, yeah. right? And so for me, there's a sense of deference when I'm like, all right, look, I got to figure this out because I know what I can do, but I also know what you can do and, and you're like in a different pantheon that I consider myself to be in. So you ha it's, it's trying to find the, the grace to navigate your own ego yeah. to create the space, unless they're just an asshole, right? And he, he was not just an asshole, but... <laughs> the, well, but some people are just assholes, yeah. right? Like some people are just like, oh, you're just a prick and you want to make this process difficult sure, yeah. and the end result is nothing good, right. right? He wanted something good and the, like, for instance, to use a different actor, when I worked with Donald Sutherland, That's a, Donald is a hard ass, yeah. right? And he's a hard ass for all of the right reasons. Yeah. He wants the best work, he demands the best of everybody around him, and he wants to make sure that nothing that he puts on camera is anything less than his best work, which I really appreciate. And it definitely leads you into conflict sometimes, but that was one of the best working relationships that I've ever had because I never got into any argument or disagreement with Donald Sutherland that wasn't ultimately about doing something good. And I'm totally happy in that space, yeah. right? Like, I don't care if, like, if, if you need to, if we need to scream and yell to get to the end of what something good is, I'm happy to scream and yell with you. And, and Harvey was a bit like that, too. We just had different processes. Yeah. He's very, very method, which is something that I hadn't really worked with since Vincent D'Onofrio right at the very beginning of my career. Sure. So it just was a different learning process for me to understand, like, how does this tick to get into the, the show?
You know, it's really interesting. We've had many stars here, and they say a lot of times you arrive on a film set, it's like, hey, how are you today? Right. A lot of directors don't like to rehearse. They let you shoot this stuff. But when you're coming from different ways into the thing, it's got to be really hard unless, you know, you get to rehearse for a Broadway show or for a play. You right. You six, eight, four, five weeks or whatever. Well, also, specific, I mean, yeah. Harvey comes from a very specific school, oh, yeah. right? And that very specific school has a very specific methodology. Yeah which I am not from, right? And I am not trained in that way. So for the two of us to try to navigate the space together is hard because I don't know those signals or signs or that technique. So it was just difficult for us to be in that same space. Whereas somebody like Donald is also a hard ass, right? But he's a hard ass in a way that I understand yeah. and I never once thought he was being a prima donna, right? He is a guy who was always trying to fight for something that he thought was right. Beautiful. Well, like I said, the, the first part of the week, I went back and watched all these films. You're phenomenal in all of them. So just so you know that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> then you went to London to do a play, A Life in the Theater, by David Mamet, opposite the great Patrick Stewart. I saw you in that. We went over to London to see you in that. And the two of you were magic. What made that, go ahead, what, what made that such a great play to do? What, well, so that's nice of you to say, yeah. but really, he was magic, yeah. and he let me come for the ride. Because, <laughs> well, at that point, I hadn't been on stage since I was a kid, right? So the, the learning process for me of just being on a stage, period, before we get to the Patrick Stewart portion of it, or the David Mamet portion of it, or the West End portion of it, right? It was just a lot for me to, to take on. And he was an angel yeah. because had he been a prima donna right yeah. like i said i've had this opportunity to work with a lot of of very strong actors who have done me right <laughs> because had he desired to destroy me he absolutely could have i mean it's a two-hander yeah. he's patrick stewart he could have just massacred me on stage every night but he didn't because that's not the the type of man that he is and so you know, the, that, it was, that was actually the thing that reignited my love for this job. It was doing that show. Because after Dawson's Creek, I was kind of burnt out. I'd, I'd never worked that, uh, over that length of time on a single project before my career, obviously. And, and the, you know, the time constraints of, of network television particularly are extremely intense. And so to get to the end of that process, it took a little while, and it wasn't until I got on stage with Patrick where I was like, oh, right, I love this. This is amazing. I want to do this with the rest of my life. It, like, fills the battery up all over again, doesn't it? Yeah. Why you got into the business yeah, in the first completely. place. Yeah. But you were frightened to go into that. I think that's a great thing. Well, yeah, I mean, I was frightened to go into this. I, the, yeah. the best jobs that I've ever done, yeah. I mean, truly, like, the... You know, when I finally agreed to to take this thing on that we're doing across the street, um, you know, I had to. It, you read that script, and I don't stop talking for 130 pages. <laughs> so just from a like a focus and memorization place, I was like, "Ooh, that's not easy." And then I learned another language. I mean, I perform in actually three languages, right? There's sign language, there's simcoming, which is the hardest, and then there's English. So to take on the challenge of of like doing that. If we were at you know, a regional theater in Vancouver, yeah. that would be one thing, but we're not. <laughs> but look at you learn as an actor. That's why I think it's really great about being creative. You learn so much more that you take on to the next project or something you, you know, that you yeah. can fill yourself up with. Well, that's with. the, I mean, it, it, in its essence, I tell stories for a living, yeah. right? And the beauty of, of telling stories is that to have a new story to tell, you have to experience something. Yeah. And so each time I go and tell a new story, I get to experience something new, put myself into a new environment, have a new thought process with a new group of people. And it is in that process that I, that, you know, I'm, I guess I'm Cyrano in this, like this is the thing that keeps me alive. It's why, it's why I want to keep on doing this. Lovely. You got to work again with your co-star from the Mighty Ducks, Emilio Estevez, in his film, Bobby. But this time, he was the writer and director. The film, of course, for those of you who don't know, is the fictionalized account of the hours leading up to the shooting of U.S. Senator Robert F. Kennedy. What was it like working with your friend on the other side of the camera? Well, so, speaking of the, the, like, the great people that I've had the opportunity to work with, Emilio deserves a special mention because he was the one, at the very, very beginning of my career, my mother explained to me that this was a job, right, and it must be respected as such. 
But it wasn't until, because you don't listen to your parents, it wasn't until I got <laughs> to the set of The Mighty Ducks that Emilio, by example, yeah. was like, this is how you can do this. This is how you can do this respectfully. This is how you can do it professionally. This is how you can do it graciously. And I'm going to show, not just me, but all the yeah. kids, I'm going to show you how to be good in this space. And it was him laying that groundwork yeah. that has probably been the reason that I've been able to maintain this career for all these years. Because through him, I saw like, oh, look, you can be the alpha on a set and do it well and be a decent human and show up and be ready to work and know your words and hit your marks and remember everybody's name and like you can be a good person in doing this. And if I had somebody else in the beginning who was more casual about all of those things, it would have changed my trajectory. So to go and then, I mean, he tried for so long to get Bobby made and it was such a good script, people kept on wanting to take it away from him. And he passionately and devotedly stuck with it. It was like, no, no, I'm directing this thing because I know this story, this is my story to tell. And to get to be a part of him achieving that was a beautiful thing. And also to be able to perform for him as a grown-up, to, you know, like, kind of like, hey, guy, look, <laughs> I'm good now. <laughs> <laughs> Great film. You also appeared on one of the most iconic television shows, The Simpsons. Simpsons fans <laughs> here in season 12. You were the love interest of Lisa, right? It was, actually, that year was the, it's all been downhill since that year. So <laughs> I did Saturday Night Live and The Simpsons in the same year. And like, you really can't top that season. Yeah. That's it. So, all right, so let's talk about The Simpsons first. Okay. What's it like living in that world of The Simpsons and then go to SNL? Um, so, like, massive Simpsons fan. Okay. Um, it was so bizarre to go and do, like, just as a, just as a full nerd exercise, to sit at the read-through and all of these, at that point, like, mostly, like, nice middle-aged yeah. people and have those voices pop out of their head is just, like, so disconcerting. <laughs> and you're like, hi, how are you? And then all of a sudden, like, oh, my God, I've loved you since I was a kid. Yeah. And it turns out you're a 50-year-old woman. I had no idea. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, that was just, it was just craziness. I mean, I can't believe I'm in this, I'm in The Simpsons. That's real. That happened. It's like, how do you focus in that room? Like, trying to, you have you a line can't. coming up. There's no way. Yeah. Also, they're so talented. Like, yeah. multiple cast members play multiple roles. <laughs> so, like, it, you just, I mean, it's just impossible yeah. to imagine. But you're, you're sitting there and yeah. suddenly, like, a, one person will be doing a scene with themselves because they're actually doing both <laughs> characters inside of the scene and fully flipping yeah. the voices. No pauses, yeah. no nothing. It's just crazy. It's crazy. So that was a great experience. And then, yeah, then I got to host Saturday Night Live, which I'm also a massive fan of. <coughs> and, I mean, prob I don't think I missed an episode from, like, yeah. you know, 9 to 19, probably. Um, and to get to go and be in that space, yeah. which is so unbelievably nerve-wracking, and they, <laughs> it's not, you should never do it if you're a fan. Because <laughs> all fans know that there are bad episodes, yeah. right? <laughs> and you don't want to be one of those bad episodes. <laughs> and a lot of times the bad episodes are because of the host. And when you get there, so normally you have the whole week yeah. to rehearse, but because I was shooting Dawson's, I didn't have the whole week, so I showed up on a Wednesday, and they give you 140 sketches, and they're like, cut half of these right now. And then you meet the writers. So you literally have just shat on half of their work. And then you meet them like, hi, I'm Josh. Oh, great. No, nice to meet you, too. Like, My scene's not in this Yeah, space. exactly. I hate you. So, yeah, that was a crazy experience. <laughs> okay, so right before you come through, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Joshua Jackson, those doors open. Where is your mind? Uh, <laughs> so two things happened right before they opened the door. One... A very nice man came up to me and said, I, we made a couple last minute changes into the opening <laughs> monologue. You'll see them reflected in the cards. Oh. Which, as a person who doesn't do, do a lot of live stuff, I was like, I'm sorry, what? I <laughs> memorized this. This is my job. Oh. And then I compulsively checked to make sure that my fly was up probably 300 times. Yes. Like, I don't know why, but I was obsessed. Like, no, I'm good, I'm good. No, wait. No, I'm okay. I'm okay, I'm okay. Wait, is it three steps or two steps? Three steps or two steps? Three steps, two steps down. Three steps. Wait, shit. Oh, no, okay, I'm okay. Yeah. Oh, it's I weird, like, the nervous it place. It must have felt like three hours. Yeah. No, the door's open. Well, yeah, and then, and then the opening actually is three hours. Like, it takes forever for them to get through the opening credits. Yeah. And then they open the door, and you're just like, 
oh my God, please don't fall down these stairs. Please don't fall down these stairs. Please don't fall down these stairs. <laughs> I'm going back to watch yours again <laughs> with that mindset. Now I know your mindset from that, but terrific. From 2008 to 2013, you played lead role of Peter Bishop on the hit Fox TV science fiction series, Fringe. <laughs> created by J.J. Abrams. All right, what attracted you to this and what's it like? I met J.J. Abrams, he's one of the producers of the play that went wrong. Okay. What is he like to work with? He was the sweetest it's guy It's good to, to see that to. he's found some success. Exactly. <laughs> <coughs> What's it like working with him and what you love about that show and what attracted you? Well, what attracted me was just purely the script. The, I, I mean, I'm a science fiction fan, so the, it was just so smart and interesting. And I grew up watching The X-Files and it felt yeah. very much like The X-Files to me. Um, and so that was the initial attraction. And then, you know, to be inside of... TV shows are hard to make. So when you sign on, particularly for a network TV show, you have to know that the group of people that you're working with not only can write that one script, but they can write the 99 that follow it and, and tell that story well, right? And have the, yeah. the wherewithal to do that. And that's an unusual skill. So yeah. that, that's the, that was the thing that brought me into that show. It was the, the script itself was fantastic. And then just JJ being JJ and the world that he has created around himself is the reason that I wanted to be. What a great role to play, right? It was, it was a great role to play, and the, and the way that it developed, particularly in the relationship that I had with John, like the father-son yeah. dynamic that we were able to pull out of that to sort of ground that relationship in a sense of reality that existed outside of the craziness of what was happening around, that was really, that was, that's sort of the central joy of that show over the course of its entire run for me. Great. One of my favorite films of yours is One Week. If you haven't seen this film, you need to see this film where you won Canada's Genie Award as Best Actor for your portrayal of Ben Tyler, a man who was diagnosed with cancer. And you decide to take a motorcycle trip, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this was a personal favorite of yours, wasn't it? Yes. I mean, again, so very, I'm very script-based, but yeah. at that point in my life, the, I, I was doing a lot of traveling just to post Austin's kind of figuring myself out and that script came to me and it was all about uh, using the framework of this man's terminal diagnosis the a man coming to rights to, with himself by journeying through his country and I don't know if there's any Canadians in here but we're particularly proud of being Canadian and it is a very beautiful place yeah. and so the opportunity to go to get it to tell a story with a man who sort of reconciles himself to his own mortality through his falling in love with his own country was catnip for me. Great film. And now you're on one of the most successful Showtime series, the Golden Globe Award winning The Affair. Yes. <laughs> which is getting ready to begin its fourth season on June 17th, right? Yep. Sunday evening, June 17th. So get ready for that. Talk about working on this phenomenal show and playing Cole Lockhart. Well, um, it was, I mean, the, the, this, again, another gang of actors that is oh. just brilliant. And I don't, unfortunately, have enough time to work with Dom or, or Mora. But I do get to work a lot with Ruth and Catalina. And to have access to women like that is amazing. So in the beginning, again, script-based, just that... When I read that script, I was like, wow, that is such a smart telling of this story. And so interesting and so... Even though it's a, it's almost a science fiction-y concept, right? This the sliding doors thing, but it's so immediately understandable to anybody who's actually been in a conversation with another human being, right? Like, no, no, that's not what I said. What I said was, no, 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 that's not what you said. What you said was, I mean, everybody has had that dynamic at some point in their life of, of missed remembrances or an argument over a specific memory, and so. That was what brought me in. And then particularly in that first season where essentially all of my work was with Ruth and there's nothing ever light or easy on that yeah. show. So we had to dive right into the thick of things. Um, and then to have access to an actress like that is just, I mean, th these are the joys of an actor's life. Yeah. I mean, she is, I think, maybe a generationally important actress, like, oh, again, yes. in a different pantheon and to have access to her mind and obviously to her talent on screen, but just to like be in company with her was a real joy. Is it a quick shoot, The Affair? Uh, it's quick by the standards of, of a network TV show, but it takes, for the 10 to 12 episodes, I think we shoot for like five or six months, 
which for me, coming from network TV, is like, nah, walk in the park. Okay. <laughs> How long does it normally take to shoot an episode? Uh, I think we were pretty quick. We were generally shooting, shooting them out in like eight or nine days. Do you rehearse a lot for that show? We did. The, yeah. This last year, the storylines were really broken apart in the fourth season, yeah. so the, the company wasn't really ever together, so we didn't rehearse as much this year. But in the beginning, yeah, I mean, it, we would rehearse, but we would also do something that's very unusual in the, in the first couple seasons, which is we would rehearse on set. Because there's never really any action piece, there's, not a, there's no technical difficulty to the shooting, our filming days were quite often filled with workshopping, and then shooting, which is kind of, I mean, in my work experience of television, unheard of. Yeah. So we would spend two, three, four hours working through the scenes and then shoot them. Because it's not, you know, it's not a glossy show. It's not supposed to be glamorous. There's not a lot of technical complexity. So the space was created for the director and the actors to actually be like, okay, so this is the intent. This is the story we're trying to tell. Let's break this thing apart, try it from a bunch of different angles, and, and until we know it, not shoot it, yeah. which is not usually the case. Beautiful. Are you really good at memorizing lines? Um, no. And, and well, we're at SAG and not yeah. at the WGA, so I can say this. I actually don't think it's all that important. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, you can't change somebody's intent, right? And a good writer is, is, a, is a pink unicorn, right? Should be loved, beloved, cherished, and nourished. Yeah. But to simply recite words is not really the job. And the process of discovering the language is just like being alive. So, I mean, obviously, on stage, that's a different thing. But, yeah. but when, particularly for television, when the words are generated at such a rapid pace, it's more about discovering the truth of what they're trying to say rather than like hitting every period and comma. I can hear David Mamet screaming at me right now, but <laughs> <coughs> right? But but like it's so I so I, I the I don't trouble myself too intensely with memorizing every if and or but, so long as I'm able to, in concert with the writer, make sure that I'm getting across the story that they want to tell. It's interesting that you say that a lot of TV in New York is doing that now. Like, The Deuce does that, I know, but it's the intent of the scene. When you run through the scene with the director and the actors, they're like, they're, it's not all pervadum, it's all sort of like, oh, I know where we're going here, there's a little more improv added into the thing, which makes it all more natural. It makes it more naturalistic, yeah. which is more interesting, I think, but it also, the look, it's unreasonable to think that any group of writers could crank out 90 pages yeah. in 14 days. Right? So, so why, why lie to each other? If, if, you, like, if, if this is like 80% of the script that you wanted to get out, but all of the intentions are correct, but maybe you forgot about that episode three episodes ago where this character said something that doesn't agree with this, like, that's okay, right? It's a, <coughs> pardon me, it's a working document, yeah. right? Just like, I really hope that you're not going to just broadcast take one of one angle, right? You're going to cut this thing together. We're going to make this thing together. And as we make it together, we will make it better so long as everybody's pulling in the right direction. See, that's what I love about your show and a lot of other television shows. They're all very natural. If three people are sitting in a room, some people may stutter a little bit, someone takes another breath. I mean, it's how people normally do. Right. So that's what I like about all yeah, this. I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, different versions of storytelling, right? There are, yeah. the, there are more, there are glossier shows, and, and those are awesome too, right? It's just a different version. But yeah. when, you're, when you're aiming for naturalism, yeah, like when the, when the things clink and people cough, and that's good, right? That's like, yeah. that shit happens. Every day. Yeah. Yeah. We have many actors in the house today and, of course, watching, so I need to ask you about auditioning. Okay. Auditioning is such a large part of what this business is. Were you always good at auditioning? No, I'm still not good at auditioning. And I got in an argument with Kenny the other night about auditioning, and he actually gave me a... He <laughs> finally made... Somebody made sense to me about why this is necessary. <laughs> <laughs> so... Oh, that's... He was like... he Because I, I was pissing and moaning about how hard it is to display a character from two scenes or three scenes. And that I'm still so frustrated with the process of auditioning because I feel like I, I mean, if I'm the right actor for the role, I feel like I know how to do this character, but maybe not just the two scenes. And I always feel like I'm at a deficit because I don't know what it is that you're looking for when, you, when I come into the room. 
And, yeah. and Kenny said, <laughs> right? And Kenny was like, well, because you, you're thinking about this wrong. You're not auditioning for the role, you're auditioning for your career. You don't come in for that job, you come in for every job. So if you stop thinking like, how do I please this single person in this room for this one specific job? And you start thinking, where is my pride in the thing that I'm laying down right now? So that by the time I get to the end of this piece and I put it on the table and I walk out the room, I don't need to ask your approval for anything because I'm auditioning for my career. Wow. I mean, it took me 30 years to hear those words, but hey, I'm here now. <laughs> no, it's, it's a weird thing. Like you said, there you are auditioning for Dawson's Creek and one big person is yeah. sleeping at the table. It's like, how do you like zone that out? It's like, wake up. You, you don't. don't. I mean, he yeah. was sleeping. There's yeah. no way to not notice that the executive at the table, I mean, there was yeah. seven of her, eight of them, yeah. but he was literally <laughs> <laughs> And I'd had enough bad auditions at that point that I was yeah. like, all right, well, I guess I'm not getting this job. But, but yeah, I mean, he was just asleep. Yeah. Like, not in any way trying to cover up the fact that he was asleep. <laughs> not bored, yeah. not uninterested, <laughs> asleep. <laughs> it's a good chapter for your book. Yeah. I hope you plan on writing a book. We have some questions from the audience. The first one is, could you talk a little bit about Pacey's affair with his high school teacher, signed an older woman? <laughs> <laughs> um, well... At the time, it didn't seem all that crazy to me because I was <laughs> headstrong, like I said. I was like, of course this would happen. I mean, I think that's every 17-year-old boy's fantasy that you have this gorgeous high school teacher who is somehow interested in all of your pimples and quirks. Um, and, and what was strange about that dynamic is that as we got just pilloried in the press for two teenage people laying clothed in a bed, talking about what would happen if they were to have sex. Nobody ever mentioned the fact that a teenager was fucking his adult teacher. Yeah. It just was like, oh, well, whatever. <laughs> I mean, yeah, anyway, yeah. it was strange. Of all the interesting roles you have played, what role did you find the most challenging? This one, by far. Yeah. James Leeds is the hardest thing. I, I mean, I'm not even sure that there is I hope to have another 30 years of this career, but there's just before even getting into the emotional difficulty of it, the, the technical difficulty of putting that on stage every night is unlike anything I've ever tried, and I'm not sure that I'll ever do anything as, as complex as this again. So do you like to get to the theater early or a lot before half hour or half hour? What's oh, your prep a lot. before? Yeah. Well, so in order to, to warm up my hands, yeah. I have to, I don't have to, but Lauren and I, it's actually something I was taught by Patrick. So Patrick... He and I would always get together about a half before the half, sometimes an hour before the half, and run two scenes from the play, and then just discuss what worked, what didn't work from the night before, like, and just try to fine-tune every night little pieces, and sometimes try things that didn't work and whatever, like just through the course of the run. So I love that, and I started that with Lauren. So we get together usually an hour before the half, and we'll talk about what we thought was like good and bad or indifferent about the night before, what we can fine tune, a change we want to try, and then we'll just run two scenes. And that's just to get everything limber, but also specifically for this play, just to warm up my hands. Yeah. Well, like I said, you're on stage for the whole entire show, from the second he walks on stage till you take your bow. <laughs> so what are the last few things you do right before they call places and you go on? Um, well... Right before places, I try to, particularly for the second act, but I try to like drink about, I don't know, a liter of water as much as I can get into my system because I'm pushing out so much over the course of that first act. Um, and then, I should admit this, but I, I, w I have been an on-again, off-again smoker. I had to quit smoking for this because there's no way I would be able to get through the show. And then I pop a piece of Nicorette and I go down to the stage door. <laughs> That's the process. I love that. Well, you do it well. What are your considerations when you agree to do roles in independent films? Do you simply do roles you find interesting or do you rely on the advice of an agent? How do you choose indies that you want to do? Mm, it's a combination of things. So it starts with the text, but then it's the group of people, right? The yeah. The... I'm at the place in my, my life and my work where I really want to 
be challenged in positive ways by good people. So, <coughs> so it's the the group of people. And then if I'm unsure, like I was just having a, this conversation with an actor friend of mine about she'd been offered a job and it's challenging in a way that she's unsure about, right? And which is something I'm very familiar with. So what is my reaction? Am I reacting negatively or uh, am I feeling queasy about this because I don't like it or because it's actually pushing me in a direction that I need to go in, but, but that's scary. And I'm not sure if I want to do that. And that's, that's where the, like, a good agent or people that I've worked with for a long time, I will rely on those voices to be like, I'm not judging myself correctly right now. I don't know what it is that I'm reacting to. So read this and, and tell me what you think, and then let's discuss. Because you seem to like to challenge yourself, because everything you do is different. Well, yeah, that's the joy of the job. Yeah. The, I mean, the, the, you know, <laughs> I mean, in the, in the, <laughs> the funny version of this, there's lots of my career that I can't go back to, right? I just got old. So there, <laughs> I, even I, if I wanted to go back to that, well, I couldn't. Yeah. But yeah, the joy of the job is to, to be in motion. And, and, and that's nice of you, but not everything. I mean, I've certainly done things that were resting on my laurels or jobs for jobs or different transitions in my life. So I'll cop to that. But, but yeah, in the, in, the, in the moments that have been the most important and the most rewarding for me, it has been because I have pushed myself, even in the places of failure, frankly, and there have been some of those, I have pushed myself to do something that I didn't know how to do but wanted to learn. Going back to Mamet for a second, was he in the West End with you when you were working on this play? He wasn't in the rehearsal process, but he came to see the show, which is a very, very heavy night. Okay. <laughs> Did you know he was there? Uh, we knew he was there because wow. he doesn't like um, recorded sound in his plays, and we use some recorded sound. So there was a possibility that he was going to shut our show down. Um, and he wanted to come and see it before he just mandated it and came and saw it and thankfully loved it. Um, and so I got to have like that weird day of all day, like I might be out of work tomorrow morning and then going and doing a play with Patrick Stewart, which is already awesome. And then David Mamet being in my dressing room after him and be like, you nailed that. That's the best I've ever seen this. And being like, oh my God, what? <laughs> I hope you recorded that. Yeah, I wish I had. I was like, you should have told me you were coming. <laughs> You got all of his ends and commas and sides <laughs> yes, and everything exactly. else. Like, no, but you guys are flawless in that. But like I said, it all goes back to Patrick, too. I had him in yeah. the chair here. He and Ian McKellen sat with me together, and that was like one of those pinch me moments. I was about to say, my... that's a bad pair. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was a bummer of a day for oh you. Oh, my God. There was like, there's so much love it between those two men, yeah. too. And I mean, just, but just their work ethic in general, like you said about you and Patrick, and it could have gone a whole other way, and well, he's such he, a lovely man. So in the way that, that yeah. particularly Brits of that era, but yeah. Brits in general, acting is a real profession there, yeah. right? Whereas here we sort of treat it like as this fanciful thing that, that lots of people get into for not the right reasons. And there, like, the, I, I mean, I don't know the, the intricacies of their friendship, but I think a lot of it is based upon the fact that they did the work, right? Yeah. They did yeah. all of those tours and they did spent all of that time and they lived that life for not years, but decades yeah. before arriving at the place that they are now. And so the intimacy of that bond is, is I mean, something I, w I, I can't imagine the joy of spending a life in company with somebody in your most intimate place, that, that in a non-sexual way, yeah. right? Because they, they, their, their life and their work and their craft is something that they have shared through every phase of their life together and still take tremendous joy from it and have found their own successes in it individually. And then when they're on stage together, it's just a phenomenon. Um, did you, wh when were they here? Were they working? They were doing Godot. They did Godot, okay, yeah. so you did see it. So yeah. the, oh, <laughs> like, the two of them in no oh man's land. Oh my God, like just unbelievable, right? I mean, I remember sitting there watching, like, wow, I can work for another 60 years and never figure out how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, the other thing is, we, I had sat with them here for SAG and then they had asked me to do their last talk back at the theater. Oh. And, but they, and the show was at 7.30 and they <coughs> said, they both want to see you at seven o'clock. I'm like, oh my God, they have this like three hour show to do. Like, no, they want to see you at seven o'clock. Like, and like 7.15, I'm still in all the dressing rooms and I'm like, Ian just sitting there eating grapes in his teeny tiny dressing room and Patrick's <laughs> having his hair done, you know, having the wig piece put on. But they are the coolest men. I'm like, I said, you go on in like seven minutes. Oh no, have some grapes. Yeah. I mean, no, 
But it's like, it's, it's, it's the, I didn't know how they did it. And then they go on there and they do three hours. Right. And not just three hours, like three hours of like, fire. Oh, yeah, totally. So yeah. you take this stuff away yeah. from there. You have such a long, beautiful career. Is there something you'd like to try next? Do you have your mind on some kind of role or something you'd like to go after next? Right now, I'm totally focused on this. So the, yeah. in a way that I have not had the opportunity, to, the, the, the attention that it takes to just get through yeah. every single show on doing this is complete. So I, there is no space in me right now to even think about whatever comes next. Like this is the sole and central focus of my life right now. Beautiful. A question for someone who's going to see the show tonight. What is one of your favorite parts of a show and does it change nightly? Yeah, it changes all the time. I mean, the, the easiest answer is the climax of the show when we get into the, the, the final sequence of scenes because you just get to see Lauren's just raw power, but there is like there's a it changes, but it, there's the, the first couple of classroom scenes or the restaurant scene when you I, I mean you know in a platonic because she's married, but it I, like the I get to fall in love with this amazing woman every night, and so the so for me the joy of that falling in love every night is a little bit different. But I would say, yeah, like, watch the restaurant scene, and if it's really crackling tonight, you just get to see two people, like, come and meet each other. Love it. If acting didn't work out for you, what would you have done? Mm, I was a difficult child. So I'm not <laughs> sure that it would have turned out all that well for me. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and thankfully I never had to answer the question, but... Um, you know, I'd probably still be kicking around Vancouver, hopefully not incarcerated. Fabulous. <laughs> well, you could have had your own theater up there, maybe, or whatever else. I, I don't think, the thing is, I don't know that I would have had, I, it took me, it took, it took a long time for me to give myself permission to admit that I was an actor. And I don't know that I would have had the strength of character yeah. to go that route. Interesting. You have a reputation of being extremely warm and nice to everyone on a set and everyone you know. Would you talk about this positively or the positive effects of your work ethic? Well, I mean, in so much as it's a conscious thought, I do think, like, you know, when you're on camera, you're not in a bubble. You're yeah. in an environment. And I would always choose to work in an environment where there is happiness or joy or positivity, especially if you're going to be doing things that are ugly or uncomfortable. Yeah. I also just think that, that, you know, in my introduction to this business was as work. My mother did this as work. She told me that this is a job. Emilio said, this is a job. You have to, I mean, and again, I go back to Emilio. Like, Emilio would wake up, show up to, to work every day, shake everybody's hand, he would know everybody's name. And in that way, what you're immediately telling somebody is like, we're in this together. Yeah. And I just, I, I, long before it was conscious, it was like, huh, that's a really good thing to do, right? Like we are all on this team together trying to make this thing. And it doesn't really matter what you're doing on the set. Like if I'm the leading man of this show, I need you to be doing your best work too so that you can help me to do my best work. And so, if I'm going to be a dickhead to the teamster who's driving me to work, I'm setting off a chain of events for dickheadery all through that company. Yeah. <laughs> and there's no need for that, right? Like, especially like, when this stuff is hard. I, I mean, I understand, I have, and I get it. Like, when you're frustrated or, or the work, it's not coming naturally or you're feeling you know, whatever is right here, I get it why people can be assholes. But you're making it harder on yourself. Yeah. If, if you make that environment toxic, you are going to sit in that shitty, toxic environment for hours and hours and hours every day. And it's not going to make anything that you're trying to do on camera any easier. Yeah. So why? I love it. <laughs> um, this is an acting question. What is something that you used to think that you had to do that you now never do with your acting? Is there something? Hmm. Um... That is an interesting question that I have never considered. Something that I th used to think I had to do. I don't have a, a good or ready answer yeah. for that, honestly. I mean, things, I've been doing this for so long, things have shifted. Yeah. 
things have shifted over time, and some habits have just remained, and I, and others have fallen by the wayside. But I haven't really examined which is which. Got it. Fair enough. Do you find yourself ever trying to practice your newly acquired ASL skills here in the city, even among strangers you notice? All the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. So if you could sum up the best part of the experience, first of being on Broadway in Children of a Lesser God and being a part of his company, what is it for you? Okay, so the, the, the first portion first, the Broadway thing, to be able to bring my family, particularly my mother, to that opening night. And even though I have talked their ears off about this show, you can't understand what it is until you see it. And uh, to have my family in that house and to see their faces afterwards as they were just like, man, what did you just do? Um, and particularly for my mother, who, who has worked in, indus in the industry and in a positive way is a very hard critic and doesn't like a lot of the things that I've done, right? I mean, she has, she's a woman of taste, so there are, <laughs> there are things that she's just like, eh, you're okay, but... And so... To come and do something that really knocked her socks off, that was an amazing night for me. And then to, you know, to be in this company, the amount of grace that has to be shown to me and all of the hearing actors by the deaf and hard of hearing actors as we try to learn their language and then the language opens the door into the community and to understanding what navigating the world as a deaf or hard of hearing person is, we hearing people in that company were just babies when we started this and said all the stupid things and made all the dumb comments and asked all the uncomfortable questions. And so to be in that place with somebody who is simultaneously up there giving it every night and doing their, I mean, everything, but also willing to be gracious in that space as we all fumble through the dark, myself included, of like, oh, what is this thing that you're experiencing? Um, like, like I said earlier, like that, that bond, that relationship is totally unique inside of my work life. Yeah. You know, one show I never asked you about was Smart People. He did on stage. He made his New York stage debut at second stage for director Kenny Leon, Lydia R. Diamond. Yeah. Brilliant playwright. What did you love the most about that experience of doing that play? There's four of you up there, right? Just the four of us. It was a four-hander. A four-hander, yeah, exactly. Um, so... In the way that I have not made my career on stage, every single thing that I have done on stage has been because I've been asking myself a really specific question and, the, and a, a piece of material allowed me to go and examine that question deeply. So this one is, a, is like, can people ever actually be truly together, right? Can you ever bridge that final gap between understanding and misunderstanding? For that one, it is, what the fuck does it mean to be a white man in America now? And how are we, how can we ever move forward in the conversation if I'm not willing to admit to myself the, the biases and the privileges of the accident of my birth? And so, which is an uncomfortable conversation and a weird place for us to end tonight, but... <laughs> But, like, that was a really specific thing that I was... And this is even pre-Trump, but this was something I was like, well, you know, we're not... I don't feel like I'm pushing myself hard enough in that place. And that play was all about examining exactly that. And that character has... I don't know, in the modern parlance... I'm too old to use this word, but he, he would call himself woke, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so he had given himself permission to do the ugly thing because he was woke which I think is not uncommon in the like, white man world, and to go through the process of that and examining what the permission structure is, was is for that character, that he allowed himself to get to that place, was something that I needed to examine at that time. Brilliant play, brilliant performances. My final question is, what is the best bit of advice that you've been given, either personally or professionally, that you live by? In all things that you do, be an observer of people. That's perfect. This has been wow. such an insightful <laughs> afternoon. It's been a master class. I thank you very much. If you haven't seen him in Children of a Lesser God, it is right across the street at Studio 54. Brilliant performance. Thank you, Joshua Jackson. Thank you so the much. The best. Thank the you. very best, my friend. No problem.